Almost every house has a room that doesn't heat or cool evenly. Its temperature is out of sync with the rest of the house and it's a problem. Allow me to introduce Flair and show you how they're fixing that. Hey guys, and welcome to one more episode of Pillar Nation. For today's interview, we have Daniel Myers, founder of Flair, the startup passionate about saving energy and increasing home comfort at an affordable cost. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining Builder Nation. Thanks. Happy to be here. My name is Dan Myers. I'm one of the co-founders at Flare. I like to say that I'm a recovering engineer. So at heart, I still think in terms of maybe code and maybe Legos. I don't know. Just love to build things. I do have, I guess I'm a computer engineering, computer scientist by background and a musician, weirdly, but sort of an odd combination. But you might be surprised at how often you encounter that in the entrepreneurial world. I've always been passionate about energy and especially electrification. I think when you look at the core of electrification, energy efficiency is right there. I think the more that we're able to not only use energy more flexibly, but also just reduce the amount we're using, the more we're going to be able to transition away from fossil fuels. So I know that you guys, talking about the company, recently raised 7.6 million shares of funding. So congratulations on that. Thanks. And you talk a little bit about the process and how this was like. Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say that was really interesting was maybe a few years ago when we would go out and fundraise, um, explaining to people what HVAC was, was a kind of an entertaining thing to do because people just looked at you with blank stares. I think in, especially in the venture capital community, the built environment was like the least sexy thing you could be working on. Right. I mean, there was crypto and there was all these interesting other things happening in the software world and hardware was already a small community. And then hardware that was going into a home and was about energy was not interesting. Mm -hmm. Something happened right around the time when COVID happened, where I feel like the awareness around climate and buildings just all of a sudden changed. And there was just venture capitalists looking to talk to startups that were working in HVAC. It was such a weird phenomenon. So it was a really fascinating and honestly kind of a relief that there was so much interest in this space we've been working in for a long time. And I think it just aligned well with really where the business was. We had sort of moved from being a consumer only business to a business that was selling into professional HVAC installers. We do both, but that was really starting to take off. And we also built some solutions for electrification that were getting some fantastic rebates opened up in different markets and just kind of like a lot of things came together. The stars sort of aligned at the right time. We then had some fantastic investors that we got in touch with that saw it and got it and understood it. And honestly, from there, it came together pretty quickly. So I think it was just a matter of finding the right folks, but also be at the right place in the right time is sometimes just the most important thing. <laughs> Totally. You mentioned the pandemic. Maybe it was a positive impact instead of like being a challenge, if we can put it like that. So talking about challenges, what would you say it has been the biggest challenge in Flare? I would say probably the biggest challenge at Flare. Um, well, it's changed with time. I would say that like early on, the challenge was always really getting capital for. I think it was pretty tricky to get investors who kind of got it, who could see it and who were willing to invest in hardware and frankly, first time founders. That is a pretty big deal when it comes to funding. I think founders who've got an exit under their belt, they can go after maybe some of the more difficult markets and problems that they're trying to solve. But the first time, no track record, nobody knows you, you've got to prove yourself. So we were pretty bootstrappy early on as a result that ended up helping us because I think it built in good fundamentals, but I think, you know, first money, then you sort of solve money and then you solve a little bit of growth with that money. And then all of a sudden to grow more, you need more money. So I feel like there's this constant undulation between the capital side, the growth side. And then I think during the pandemic, supply chains became quite complicated. And what was interesting about that is it wasn't strictly our supply chain either. We install heat pump controls, right? And other types of controls. So even if we could get a hold of our product, a lot of times they get installed alongside the actual heat pumps and heat pump supply chains got really tight, especially in the first year and a half, two years of the pandemic. So that was actually pretty stressful because we had a lot of contractors who were like, yeah, I've got all these jobs booked and all these units ready to go, but I actually don't have the other things I need to finish my job. So I'm just kind of waiting. That was pretty challenging. I think 
it's changed with time, but it's gotten a little easier as we've just sort of grown and matured. Supply chain has been a real challenge in the industry. And I mean, I'm surprised to hear that because you've been the founder. And I think it depends on the kind of company because most of the founders tell me that they are super involved in the procurement process or with the engineers and some of them, they're not. So how is this like for you? Our main supply chain is out of China. Um, and we actually did a program backed by SOS Ventures. Uh, it's an accelerator called Hacks and it lands you in Shenzhen, the hardware capital of the world. My co-founder and I lived there for a good amount of time. I lived there for about eight months. He lived there through the second major production run. So and Phil was really turnkey. So supply chain was no joke. I think in the first few years of the business, we had blinders on and we were just, how do we get the product built? Right. But then eventually manufacturing is up and running. We had a fairly steady process for building product, procuring all the parts, testing, everything that goes into it. Then it becomes, okay, well, you've got to go focus on the demand side. So we actually kind of split it up. And my co-founder, who also has some language skills in Mandarin and Cantonese, it just made more sense for him to be deeply involved in the supply chain because he was just more effective. He's also our CTO. So when there were technical issues, it was going to be on him anyways to go figure out like, oh, is this an electrical problem or a firmware problem, that kind of thing. Meanwhile, for me, it made more sense for me to go talk to our customers because we have a hardware product, but the majority of our engineering type actually is in the software. And the software is where most of the user experience lives. So I needed to be talking to customers. I needed to be right in our market and driving demand. He needed to be just making sure we could get the product on the supply side. So. Kind of divide and conquer was our strategy. Oh, it is a great strategy, I will say. And the fact that you have a great team, I think that's the key as well. Okay, so talking about the next steps for Flare, what will you say they are? Yeah, the first thing I would say is we got really far on our first gen of hardware. So after closing our Series A, there's obviously, you know, the basics of raising a venture round or growth. Everybody expects more revenue, more units, more users, all those kinds of things. That's pretty obvious. I think some of the things though, that we are really prioritizing are basically next generation hardware. Some of that is just getting even better at what we do already. And some of that is broadening into the things that are kind of right on the periphery of what we do. As an example, we do controls. So we fix hot room, cold room problems. We do fantastic ductless heat pump controls, but we've been moving into hybridization of buildings to help basically homeowners very easily transition into majority electric heating or outright fully electric. And there's a few little hardware pieces to that puzzle that we want to build out in our own ecosystem right now. Sometimes we do it with partners, but it'd be great to in-house it. So there's a lot of product stuff, but the, similarly, indoor air quality is always really adjacent to the energy and sort of comfort side of HVAC. So we have some fantastic opportunities there. And one of our biggest investors in our series A was 3M. And if you know anything about 3M, you know that they're one of the biggest makers of HVAC filters in the world. So there's some stuff cooking there that we're pretty excited about. The other big opportunity that we see is that, uh, and we've been working on this for a while, but I think in the next probably 12 to 24 months, we're going to see a lot of this come to fruition. Basically HVAC and renewables have to play nice together on the grid, right? They're very different places, but you know, one's demand, one supply, but at the end of the day, we're going to transition at a systems level. We have to get homes and the equipment inside of them to kind of coordinate with when there's the most low carbon energy available. And we've been making a lot of investments on the software side to make that happen. So that's something I'm particularly excited about just because there's obviously business opportunity in it, but who doesn't love, you know, waking up every morning and just avoiding a bunch of cargo. That's just a cool thing to do. We're one of the best solutions for getting those online. Uh, that's kind of like the sort of core hardware products that we provide. And that was actually my next question. What do you think makes Flares a company that is innovative in the industry? I think we've been innovative. One, in the smart vent world, we're basically the only real company right now doing this. Traditionally, there was zoning and you could go into a home and say, okay, I'm going to be focusing on the upstairs or the downstairs, or maybe, you know, the east side or the west side of the house, but we provide room level control. And when you think about it, 80% of your home is empty at any given time. And when you think about that, how much energy are we putting into empty space, right? Yeah. So I think when you get down to that room level granularity, there's a real opportunity to just solve an energy problem. And then the other thing I would say from an innovation standpoint is uh, 
We've worked with a number of utilities and state programs to really architect pathways for electrification. So if you look at some of the dirtiest homes in the United States, you'll find right now that they're installing our equipment to kind of bridge them from their existing heating systems to fully electric homes. And some of those homes are really challenging to electrify because of the way they're built, they're older. You can't just take the furnace and AC out and replace it with a heat pump. You have to put in different kinds of systems. We have some really unique capabilities to kind of combine the new and the old. And that's something that transitioning is not about what is the new thing. It's about how do I get from the old thing to the new thing? And okay. that's where we have carved out a little bit of a niche for ourselves. Are people willing to make this transition? Yeah, so it's, it comes in a couple different flavors, but the first thing I would say is we've always taken this approach to energy efficiency and electrification. Basically, we're going to provide you excellent comfort and lower costs. And those combined are oftentimes universally attractive, right? I think selling efficiency and like in terms of reduced emissions and electrification of just avoiding fossil fuel systems. For some people that really resonates and for others, that's not their thing. Our take is it's way more compelling to sell comfort, convenience, those kinds of things, and then just sneak in all these sort of other benefits. We've always looked at the world that way. I think that is the most compelling way to get adoption. And then of course, with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, and some other state initiatives, there's a lot of rebate money involved with electrification now. So not only can you get comfort and convenience, you can get cash. So I think between those, there's a lot of adoption. Wow, that's attractive. One of the last questions from your perspective, where do you think the future of the industry is going? Well, I think the obvious answer to that one is really fully electric systems. So homes that had oil and gas systems for a long time, I think that there's an expiration date on that type of equipment. People are definitely going to be thinking about not heating and cooling every square inch of their house like they used to, because it's just kind of wasteful. I do think energy is going to get more expensive as we go to more renewables. So I think that sort of efficiency and also how do you use it within a building is a big deal. Lastly, I think buildings are just going to be a part of the grid. And historically you set your thermostat and you're like, that's, it is yeah. what it is, right? But the supply side of electricity is changing and you get more wind, you get more solar. Buildings are going to have to respond to that. And I think that it's kind of a cool thing because now you can be a part of this broader energy transition as a homeowner. That's how I see it evolving. It's actually quite dynamic space right now. And last but not least, do you have an advice for future entrepreneurs starting on this path? There's a lot of different things you can say because there's just so many different scenarios to encounter as an entrepreneur. But I think there's maybe one or two things that really stick with me. One is until you do it, everybody will tell you you can't. And that's pretty normal. For everybody assumes whatever is being done today is always what will be done in perpetuity almost. And when you suggest something that kind of just bucks at that narrative, people won't always think, yes, that makes sense. And it's okay to be a bit contrarian. The other thing I would say is I think just stick with it for a while because mm. there are some companies who explode in a year or two, but the vast majority of overnight successes are a decade long build or more, right? So don't go in expecting a sprint. It's definitely a marathon. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, for being here and for sharing your experiences with us. Do you have any social media handles? Where can people find you or Flair? You can always find us at our website, which is flare.co. On Twitter, we are at Flare. Those are probably the, the best places to find us. And uh, we're always happy to talk to customers and partners. Amazing. Thank you so much. And remember, guys, that you can also find more information, interesting articles, interesting interviews, just like this one with Daniel. Directly on our website, controlhub.com slash builder-nation. We would love to, to hear from you. And once again, Daniel, thank you so much for being here, for taking the time at the podcast today. Thanks. It was a pleasure.